The one thing the NFC South has over every other division in the National Football League is they have the best quartets of quarterbacks. I don't think anybody can measure up to this division in terms of the quarterback play. Each of the organizations in this division has a legit franchise guy. Legit. Including this past year's MVP in Matt Ryan, the 2015 MVP in Cam Newton, a former Super Bowl champion and first ballot Hall of Famer in Drew Brees, and a young up-and-coming franchise guy in Jameis Winston who had the Buccaneers on the cusp of the playoffs in 2016. That's one thing the NFC South has that nobody else does is this level of quarterback play. Maybe the closest you could think of is the NFC East, but let's be completely real here. I will take a quartet of Drew Brees, Matt Ryan, Cam Newton, and Jameis Winston over Eli Manning, Kirk Cousins, Dak Prescott, and Carson Wentz any day of the week. Just a clear gap. It really is. And maybe that's what part in part led to in years past. You had so much upheaval in the division, plus you had so many teams with franchise quarterbacks. Um, who knows? But I will I do say this is that coming out of this 2017 NFL draft, you have two quarterbacks in particular. Jameis Winston and Cam Newton have to be really, really happy with what their team did. They helped their young quarterback tremendously. So let me talk about um, each of these teams and how they did in this year's draft. I'll start off with the Atlanta Falcons. You know, it's kind of challenging when you when you lose a Super Bowl in the fashion that they did, in the way that they did. You come into this draft, you've got the 31st overall pick in round one. You don't have a lot of draft pick currency in terms of additional picks. So you always look at these drafts as being kind of challenging in terms of being able to get impact players, which is crazy on the one hand because just because your picks are lower doesn't mean you can't find studs. And it happens all the time. Teams find studs all the way throughout the rounds. I think it just places a premium of importance on your scouting and your rankings and your evaluations because you maybe don't have as much margin for error. Maybe the talent level isn't quite the same, so you have to be a little bit more precise. So when I look at this Atlanta Falcons draft, I have to say I came away somewhat unimpressed, although to be fair to them, I came away unimpressed, as a lot of people did with last year's draft with Keanu Neal and Deion Jones and Devondre Campbell. It was not an impressive draft to me, and those guys all ended up stepping in and being contributors and being key contributors to a team that won the NFC and for all intents and purposes should have been Super Bowl 51 champions. So, so I, I keep that perspective in mind, is that I wasn't impressed at all with Atlanta's draft class. I thought it was terrible, and they ended up outperforming expectations. And it's possible that this year's draft class could as well. I love Tacarus McKinley. I think it'll be interesting to see how he is deployed in this Atlanta Falcons defense. I thought it was really interesting that for a guy that had a little bit of a durability concern, that they traded up from 31 to 26 and go get him, but they ultimately thought they had their dude, they added another pass rusher, um, a high-energy, high-effort, high-motor type of guy. Um, I love the player, and I think he's a good fit for them potentially. It would just be interesting to see how they utilize him in the scheme. Uh, I felt like Duke Riley from LSU was kind of a luxury pick with Jones and Campbell. I mean, is Riley going to get a chance to start in the linebacking core at some point, or is he a sub-package player? Is he a special teamer? And do you really have that talented and well-balanced of a roster where you could be potentially spending third-round picks on special teams, guys. Look, I think Riley has some starting potential at the NFL level, um, but maybe there were better picks for them at this point in time. Uh, Sean Harlow will probably get a chance to compete at right guard right away. Um, my surprise, I guess, was even with round one. I know defense was the need. Defense was the need. But, you know, you were sitting there at 31, and Forrest Lamp would have been there for you. Maybe he should have been the guy. Because I had higher grade on him than I did Tack McKinley. I love the pick of DeMonte Casey in the fifth round from San Diego State. Here's a guy with ball skills for days as kind of a nickel-dime sub-package corner. So I think he's a guy that could come in and potentially contribute right away as a rookie. But it was an average kind of C-draft. I'm not going to bash it as much as I did the one last year because, frankly, bashing it last year kind of bit me in the ass. So I will extend them a little bit of a benefit of a doubt because I can see why some of these picks were made. They might not have been the choices I made. That, that doesn't necessarily mean they were right or wrong. On the New Orleans Saints, you know, they were in a position where they traded away Brandon Cooks to get the 32nd pick. 
and I understand why they did it, but then you had best damn make sure when you trade away guys like that 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 draft pick really pans out. It's the same thing as trading away Jimmy Graham for a first-round pick. You take a Stephon Anthony, who's had moments, but then he's had other not-so-good moments. Um, so you thought that the Saints were, excuse me, going to heavily invest in the defensive side of the ball, and they ultimately did. They really benefited from other teams doing other things in front of them, especially with the Bears, what they did with Trubisky, and the three wide receivers going between picks five to nine. Because all of a sudden, if you're the Saints, you're sitting there at pick 11, and especially once Buffalo traded back and KC jumped from 27 to 10 to take Patrick Mahomes, the Bills passed on Marshawn Lattimore, and he falls right into the New Orleans Saints lap. You get your Patrick Peterson. You get your number one um, corner. You get that special type of defensive talent that this team really needed. I know there was a lot of talk and emphasis on the Saints potentially looking at pass rusher here at number 11, but I would much rather have a Marshawn Lattimore than a Derek Barnett or a Charles Hayes at pick number 11. I know what you'll say. It doesn't matter if a guy can cover if he has to cover for eight seconds because there's no pass rush, but you could say that even if a pass rush only takes three to four seconds to get there. If a guy can't cover it all outside, what difference does a pass rush make? It doesn't make that much of a difference either. Marshawn Lattimore's got stud factor. I was really more surprised with them taking Ramchick at pick 32. Uh, that kind of surprised me a little bit. Now, maybe in part, they were really hoping that Ruben Foster was going to fall to them at 32. And maybe in their particular situation, they should have been a little more aggressive once you got to where Seattle was picking at 26, maybe they should have been trying to explore to trade up to Seattle spot to go get him because they ultimately got they ultimately got humped out of Reuben Foster by the San Francisco 49ers. Ramchick has the feet to play left tackle. I don't know if he ultimately will have the ability or desire to play left tackle at the NFL level. And, you know, you already spent a 13th overall pick two years ago on Andrews Pete, and he ended up kicking inside to guard for you. So you can make an argument that that pick really didn't work out that well because he was not designed to be a guard for them. That's where they've ultimately had to put him. Um, was Ramchek really the best pick for them at pick 32 on the big board? I think absolutely not. I like Marcus Williams in the second round from Utah. Um, and I look at their third round picks, all three of them. I really like the picks. Alvin Kamara from Tennessee, a Jamal Charles type of talent. In Sean Payton's offensive system, with Drew Brees as the quarterback, yes, please. Alec Anzalone, the linebacker from Florida. If he's healthy, Sunshine can play. You look at him, he looks like Sunshine. But the kid can play. He can really play. He's got great instincts. He's got really good athleticism. He's a three-down type of player. Um, just a guy that seems to be all over the place on the football field. But he's got to be able to stay healthy. But if he is, man, you feel like you got a really good value here. A Chris Borland type, but a much better athlete. And then Trey Hendrickson, the edge rusher from Florida Atlantic in round three. You know, I thought that was a tremendous pick for them. And the gun, when you're trying to talk about addressing the pass rush, they finally addressed it here, and they addressed it with the guy uh, that I had a higher grade on than this. I love Trey Hendrickson, and I thought he was a value for them at this point in time and have the ability to develop into a little bit of a steal. It was a C-plus draft, a little bit better than average. Um, because all the goodwill they got from me for having Marshawn Lattimore just fall into their lap at 11. Uh, they took away some of that with the Ramchick selection at pick 32. I thought the Saints could have done a better job of accumulating some more draft pick currency within this draft or more so getting draft pick currency for next year's draft. What well, was the one real puzzling move for me and something I am never a fan of is taking a higher pick next year and trading it for a lower pick this year which is basically what the Saints did. They took a second-round pick in 2018 and traded it to the 49ers to take Kamara in the third round this year. A Kamara who may be limited in his opportunities behind both Adrian Peterson and Mark Ingram in that Saints backfield in 2017. I never liked that because I just don't see where those deals usually work out. I remember Bobby Bethard did that a couple times with the Chargers in the freaking 90s, and those were disasters. Yeah, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to trade a first-round pick next year to get this crappy receiver in the second round this year. Or I think at one point in time, didn't the Carolina Panthers do that when they traded up for Everett, Everett Brown? They traded a first-round pick in the next year's draft to get Everett Brown in the second round, if I remember correctly. Those moves just don't seem to work out very well. They seem to be bad ideas, and I don't know why teams do that. Now, granted, Camaro was a high second-round talent to me, 
So I get the value early in round three. I completely understand it. Um, so I don't totally bury it. I just don't typically agree with giving up higher picks next year for lesser picks this year. Just as a general rule, it doesn't seem to make a whole lot of sense. Um, but we get to the two teams that really helped out their young quarterbacks. You know, even though Cam Newton's been in the league going into now year number seven, he's still a younger quarterback, I guess you would say. But the one thing that is clearly obvious, or two things that are clearly obvious with the Carolina Panthers, is that they don't do a very good job protecting him, and he really has a crappy assortment of weapons around him on the offensive side of the ball. And the Panthers needed to address both of those areas. And in terms of the skill positions, they definitely did that with McCaffrey in round one and Curtis Samuel in round number two. And just thinking about the ways that Carolina could potentially utilize both of these guys in their offense. I mean, there could be times where you line them both up in the backfield together as pass catchers or potentially as runners. What the hell? Why not? You could deploy both of them in the slot. You could deploy both of them out wide. You could have one in the backfield, one in the slot, one in the backfield, one out wide. You know, you could do all types of different things with them. And McCaffrey is so smooth as a player, so well-rounded in his all-around skill set. By far the most well-rounded and polished and complete pass receiver out of the running back class this year, which maybe shouldn't be a surprise since his dad is easy at McCaffrey, but you're talking again about a third-generation NFL player. Um, he brings a lot to this offense, especially and the special teams as well, potentially as a returner. Uh, and then you look at Curtis Samuel. He can do quite a number of things that Christian McCaffrey do, does, but he's even more explosive than Christian McCaffrey is, and McCaffrey is underrated in terms of his explosiveness. Curtis Samuel is other level explosive compared to McCaffrey. When you look at this, if the Panthers can't figure out how to use these two guys, then I don't know what the hell is wrong with them. And then getting, getting Taylor Moten in round two, he could play guard, he could play right tackle, but again, you needed to address the protection in front of Cam Newton, and with that pick, they did just that. The only thing I really didn't like about the Panthers draft was that they traded up to get uh, Deshaun Hall in the third round from Texas A&M. I just thought there were better players on the board at that point in time, especially if you project him to be a base end in your 4-3. I don't see why you're trading up and giving up potentially multiple other picks within the draft to go up in round three like this. You know, when they did that crap to get a Devin Funches, I don't feel like that worked out particularly well, and I don't know why this would work out a whole lot of well either. But in the grand scheme of things, it may not matter that much because getting McCaffrey, Samuel, Moten, those are three guys that could have a potential impact on Cam Newton in that Panthers offense. And I think the biggest winners of all in this division have to be the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You needed more weapons for Jameis Winston. So you go out and sign Deshaun Jackson in free agency. You've got Mike Evans, uh, at least a top 10, if not top 5 option outside in the NFL. Then in round 1 at pick 19, you get O.J. Howard to fall into your lap who frankly, and when all is said and done, with some of the teams picking in front of him, like Tennessee, like Baltimore, he had no business being available at pick 19, and he was there. The Tampa Bay Buccaneers really benefited off of some of the things, again, that other teams did in front of them, and they got one of the best offensive players in this draft to fall right into their laps. And yes, you already have Cameron Brate, but again, who says it's illegal to have two tight ends? And O.J. Howard is even more skilled than Cameron Brate, who is a pretty good player. Now you take a Mike Evans, you've got a Deshaun Jackson as a vertical threat, and you bring an O.J. Howard in to pair up with Cameron Brate, you've got weapons all over the place. And then even in round three, getting Chris Godwin, the receiver from Dunn State, I thought it was insane that this kid was available at this point in time in round three. I don't get it. You watch some of his film throughout 2016, and then you watch the Rose Bowl. If nothing else, he should be a second-round pick and a high second-round pick, and the Buccaneers got him in the later portion of round number three. I wouldn't be surprised if he's starting outside at some point in time and allows you to utilize Deshaun Jackson more in the slot and do other things with him. You know, Then getting Jeremy McNichols in the fifth round from Boise State, if he's healthy, he at least gives you a change of pace uh, to Doug Martin, especially as a pass receiver. I liked Justin Evans as a pick for them because they needed some help in the back end of that secondary. I thought this was a really good draft for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And in particular, most importantly, they got three weapons for Jameis Winston in the passing game. And they needed to do that. Because it's so often the case, especially once you draft a young quarterback and you start the process of building around that young quarterback, your success rides or dies on the right arm or left arm 
depending on that quarterback. If they succeed, chances are you succeed. And if they fail, you're probably going to fail. This draft, beyond all others, did as much to help its young quarterback as anybody. And from the Buccaneers' standpoint, if this draft doesn't make them a playoff team in 2017, frankly, I don't know what they're missing at this point to get there.